Hey, everybody. Welcome to our panel on observability in the cloud native era. And I couldn't be more proud to have such an esteemed, you know, awesome panel of uh, superstars here. Uh, Charity Majors from Honeycomb, ETL Schwartz from Commodore, and Jason from Datadog. And they are going to demystify all of the things you want to know about observability in the cloud native era. Um, so I'm just going to um, give a little bit of framing to the discussion. We have uh, prepared some questions, but we are more than happy to receive questions from the audience. You have three people that you really want to tap into and make it challenging, you know. Roast them. <laughs> um, and yeah, you're definitely, so there's a mic in the center. You can stand up and uh, ask your questions. Um, so we want to talk about uh, how when systems are now getting more complex and downtime is more painful and costly, it's becoming mission critical to have actionable data about your systems to enable you make, to make the right decisions in real time, and particularly when managing high stress situations like production incidents. Uh, however, like all things system engineering, this is easier said than done. Uh, not only is there a jungle of tooling out there, uh, from open source to commercial, but understanding what to monitor and even what not to monitor, how to build your monitoring and observability, the building blocks, and really ensure that everything, eventually when you need it, your dashboards will reflect the business critical issues you need to know about. This takes years of experience. It's not easy. Um, that's why I'd like to tap into some of these monitoring and observability experts uh, for our very own community, uh, who can share some insights from their hard-earned experience. Uh, what pains and friction they see uh, and have seen um, with their user bases today, and uh, particularly with the complex cloud-native systems that people are building, um, and what are some good tips um, to overcome some of the com common challenges. So without further ado, I'm actually going to let you guys introduce yourself and tell a little bit kind of a fun fact. So get started, Jason. Uh people about yourself. All right. I'm, I guess I'm first. I'm Jason. I'm a staff developer advocate at Datadog. I've worked at a number of places that you can read up there. I don't know that they really matter, I guess. I was at Gremlin. I did a bunch of chaos engineering thing because it turns out that it's a good way to test your observability is to just break things and hopefully you can see what happens. Uh, before that, I was a software engineer at a bunch of places, MongoDB, things like that. Uh, fun fact. I used to be a chef, uh, so I would work f four 10-hour days, Monday through Thursday, and then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, worked in a restaurant, uh, and yeah. I'm still waiting for you to cook for me. <laughs> All right, ETL. So hey, uh, it's a bit, uh, a bit loud. ETL Schwartz, uh, city of Commodore. Uh, what we do, it's less known than Datadog, a bit less known. We're a Kubernetes reliability platform. Basically, we try to make Kubernetes simpler. Uh, but in my past life, I was mainly like a back-end infra guy, big companies like eBay, small companies, and like a lot of startups. So that's my background. And like a fun fact, I really like pandas, like the, the animal, right? Like not the Python oh. package. Yeah. <laughs> I was just say. No, no. <laughs> Nobody likes well, that. Okay with the package. <laughs> uh, so yeah, like that's like my mascot for uh, a lot of time. So yeah. And uh, my name is Charity. I am the co-founder and CTO of Honeycomb.io. And um, I identify as an operations engineer um, before starting a company, which was never on my radar. Before doing that, I, my niche was really being the first infra person who would come and join a bunch of software engineers when they thought they had something real that users might actually want to use. Uh, my fun fact is, uh, after a lifetime, I grew up on a farm and I, like, we ate most of our pets. I was very utilitarian when it came to animals. After a lifetime of this, I um, just got my first foster cat. And she, oh, she nice. has a dislocated jaw, so her tongue is sticking out and she eats by mashing her face into <laughs> food. She's disgusting and I love her so much. <laughs> oh, that's cute. Amazing. So it's awesome to have three of you here. Sorry. Um, so. Based on that and your uh, short uh, bios that you gave us, you all come with both hands-on experience and now you have more of an industry perspective as vendors building tooling, uh, observability tooling for cloud-native systems. Uh, I'd like you to share a little bit about what you've experienced as a practitioner that helps you understand what users need today. 
and you can get started. I mean, literally, this is why Honeycomb was started because, you know, back in the days of Parse, uh, my last job as an ops engineer, uh, it was kind of, we were doing a lot of, we were doing like microservices before. There were microservices, a lot, a lot of like cutting edge stuff that we, we didn't really have the tooling for. And as a reliability engineer, I was professionally humiliated because every day the thing was going down. It was just like every day a new app would hit the top 10 in the iTunes store and down would go Parse. And I was just like, what, what is happening? Like I tried everything. I tried all the logging tools and all the monitoring tools. And, and like, you know, what they all had in common was once you figured it out, yeah, you could add a metric, you could add a dashboard, then you could find that problem immediately the next time. But these problems weren't happening over and over again. Every time it was something different. And like the, the, the last generation of tools just isn't equipped for that. Like you really have to like have a sort of paradigm shift to, to like away from, from basic met metrics and logs to more of a event-based, uh, trace-based uh, fundamental. Okay. You see all your thoughts? Yeah, sure. So uh, like I started my career working for a company that does uh, like a fraud detection. And that basically means that our KPI was finding bad people that are using stolen credit cards. Every time our system was done, we basically lost a lot of money to bad people. And this in turn really forces you to be like quite good or at least not really bad because I was <laughs> the one writing the mails to the management every time we had a downtime. And the first line is how much money did the company lost? We lost 100K, half a million. Mm -hmm. So this like in terms really made me, first of all, not be too worried about downtime because you know it, it happens to everyone on one hand. But on the other hand, like being obsessed around what's the best way to prevent downtime and even more importantly, learning from incident and from, from like uh, past issues. So when we started Commodore, like that was the main thing that I always had in mind, like this guy or girl in the end that is super sad right now because all of his production is down, everyone is shouting at him. And all he wants to do is, you know, like to, to find the right switch to turn on in order to make sure everything works like uh, works. And I think to this day, you know, talking here with a lot of like production engineer, platform engineers, I can really relate to the pain because in the end of the day, it's like, um, it, it's hard. Like it, it's hard to be like the one in charge. So that's pretty much it. Yeah, my foray actually into this whole space is actually slightly different because I think most people come at it as a, you know, I, I have a service or I have a website and is it up or is it down? And way, way back I worked at a consultancy and one of our clients was this church in a small rural town in, in Midwestern US and every year they would have this Christmas show. And so it's probably right about this time of the year, someone else is dealing with us now at that company, but they would literally have like everybody in this town would go and try to buy tickets for their Christmas show, which was like 100,000 people in the span of like they would open up at like 10 a.m. And so it was this thing of like, I'm a web developer, I wrote PHP code. And it became the thing of it's not whether it's up or down, it's the performance, right? Can we scale and handle this? Because it's going to be down, right? Like that's a guaranteed if you, if you don't have that scale. And so mine was kind of interesting because it was mostly that got me into web performance and started to think about like how do you get things faster, uh, which is now very common with what we do, right? Everyone's thinking of performance. Slow is the new down. Yeah. yeah. It's true. It's interesting. People have zero tolerance anymore to kind of wait around for the, the website to load or anything else. Um, okay. So on that note, you guys uh, spoke about the things that kind of brought you to build the tools that you... Uh, um, have been building and also the things that you learned on the way. Um, I think one of the questions that often comes up that I've heard when I, whenever I've been kind of in, the, in this area is that, is it even possible to have visibility into all the bits and bytes that systems have today from the millions of services communicating with each other, Git, CI, CD, shift left, all the engineers touching everything all at once. Uh, it's built upon different stacks, tools, clouds, and they all behave differently. How do you find a needle in a haystack when it really matters? I mean, first of all, the answer is no. Of course, it's not possible. It's not possible. I mean, I mean, in theory, it might be possible, but in reality, nobody is going to pay for an observability, an observability, a blurb, an Ollie bill all right. that is <laughs> that is twenty times that as big as their entire production systems. Like nobody's going to do it. There are there are diminishing returns that kick in very quickly. 
Um, which is why, like all of, this is why I get really pissed off whenever people are like, we can't sample, every line is sacred. And it's like, do you know how much shit you are not gathering right now and you're totally <laughs> happy about it? Like, there's a lot of this that is visible to us, but most of it isn't because it just works. And people who are as old as, I don't know about you, but Jason and me at least, mm -hmm. we remember when it didn't just work. Remember mm -hmm. kernel crashes being like just a thing that happened every week? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. it doesn't happen anymore. We don't have to monitor that for that for the most part. We can just be resilient to it. Mm -hmm. I could keep talking, but I'll leave some. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, like the, the base premise of it's impossible, I think it's right. Like when we see, when I see like modern development, so much moving pieces, it's impossible, and even trying to do it, I think like it's a setup for failure. Like my my like two cents here is that, and then it's hard, right? Is building the application with the mindset that things are going to crash. Like everything you do, you add a feature flag, it's going to mess with your production environment. You are adding like another step over the pipeline. What will happen when this step won't work and you need to deploy something fast? Like there are so many <laughs> failure scenarios, but every time we add another layer, it's like uh, just adding more and more like le failure scenarios. And we need to have that in mind. I think the thing that is super hard for most people is they are like optimistic in nature. I don't know, like I, I was a developer, right? Like, and I wrote code and I hoped it worked like most of the time. And it took me a lot of time to understand when as a, I was a junior developer, that like nothing is going to work, or, and even if it, it does, like it looks like it's going to work, it's going to fail sometime. And I think like even the most trustworthy things, which is like obviously S3, like I remember the S3 like downtime, <laughs> and you know even the AWS, right? Like those those guys are good, right? And they stored the icon of like S3 being down on S3 because they didn't thought about like what's going to happen here. So I think like having like failure mindset is that the key thing to have. But on the other hand, I will say it's very hard to achieve that. Like you do need some maturity and some understanding of failure scenarios. Yeah, I mean to the, just to underscore the point, right? Like, yeah, you probably can instrument everything. If your app is small, if it's very, very static and you don't plan to change everything, right? Like if I had a time machine, went back to myself 20 years ago, building simple PHP apps or Perl scripts, like, yeah, I could monitor that whole thing because I had one Linux server that I compiled the kernel for and had a stupid Perl script and hasn't changed, right? But let's face it, we're here at this conference and it's cloud native con. If you're doing anything in the cloud, you're doing things dynamically, you're probably doing at least one deploy a day or even one deploy a week. It's changing enough that it's just impossible. Mm -hmm. Everything breaks, and like to the entire, mm -hmm. to, this is the entire point of this, is like why is everything so hard now that we live in the future and everything's great? <laughs> well, it's because, it's because honestly, like you can't think about your systems, you can't think about your software as just the code, right? Mm -hmm. It just, this is why unit tests are not enough, right? Your unit test, test-driven development is great, but all it tells you is that it logically probably works. But that doesn't actually mean it's going to work or do what you think it is because these systems are emergent, they're complex. You don't, this is why I feel like observability driven development, like you don't know if your code works until you've watched it in production as real users are using it. And then all you know is that it works for now for some people. Okay. I think uh, those were kind of depressing answers. I'll be <laughs> frank. All right. So let's try and like, provide some tips. Shut like, up. And truth is depressing. Like, uh, you know, everyone that tells you that, you know, yeah, you can monitor everything. I was everything. expecting more optimism and more. Uh, well, the optimistic <laughs> part is it means that you all will have jobs, yes. right? It, it gives you a chance to, Woo! well, there, there's, Round of applause. but there's that, but it's also for me, it's, you have a chance to learn. You have a chance to improve your skills and get better and develop depth in what yes. you do right? Because nobody actually, if you're a developer, you don't want to be the person that just writes code and says, I have unit tests, it works for me, right? Yes. You want to build something that's solid and reliable. And you want to build systems that are more complex. And you want to get better at these things yes. and build these really cool things. And you can't do that if you're writing stupid, simple scripts that don't break because they, they're not pushing innovation. Everything's about risk management, you know, and I don't think this is depressing at all. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> I think that you just have to have the right sense of humor. And it depends on what period of time. I think when you're in real time, it's probably depressing, but afterwards you can laugh I about it. I disagree. But then I come <laughs> from operations where, you know, I don't know. Being uh, down is funny. It's funny. It's, it's 
All right, so <laughs> following up on the previous question, maybe give us like some practical tips. Like you started to dig in there, so maybe we'll dig in a little bit further, double click on what you were saying. Like, what are some uh, good tips that you would give in order to kind of overcome the common challenges and, uh, and do your best at finding kind of the issues as close as possible to the incident? Yeah, well, I mean, how do you get better? Practice makes perfect, right? I mean, this is, for better or worse, like I took that deviation and went to Gremlin because I still believe in chaos engineering, right? And per charity shirt, sure, right? Like you either test in prod or you live a lie, right? And so, well, you could wait for those actual production outages, but hopefully you're not having those regular enough that that is actually practice, right? So you have to set up scenarios. So chaos engineering, right? Like start testing your apps, try to break them and see what you learn. Yeah, I would say that, you know, like the, the thing with chaos engineering that always, you know, on the, I understand chaos engineering, but my feeling, especially as a vendor, right, but also as a practitioner, there's a lot of chaos always happening. Like I think most people have enough production issues as it is, like to, to you know, they don't need to add more production issues. I think the, the play of like, how do I learn from one production issue to another, like this is, this is my answer for that. I think, again, most people don't really know how to understand, like how to learn from one production, production issue to another. Usually, usually like for every production issue, like two things went wrong. Like there's the actual problem, I don't know, I wrote a bad code or something like that. And something around the process, processes or observability was broken as well. Because if not, maybe I would have detected that sooner. And I think like doing those post-mortems, learning from one production issue to another, same if you're using chaos engineering, like, okay, now I know things are failing. What's going to happen next time? I think like this is something that not a lot of companies are doing and can really help them elevate their game as time progress. Yeah, I mean, you could say it's depressing, but I actually think it's not because there are so many things that are broken in your systems right now and it's fine. Like, we're resilient to most things failing. Like, there's little, like, um, you know, bits getting flipped on disks all the time from solar arrays. We're resilient to them, right? There are Linux kernel problems happening all the time. We're resilient to them, right? The, the thing about cloud native is that the, we, we're able to have a level of abstraction now that we can more or less stick, stick around in and build our apps without having to, to deal. Everything breaks eventually, but we are getting better over time. Like there is so much software now that you can just take for granted and you don't even think about, which lets you, which frees up your, your, your time to actually focus on the code that matters, right? Your software, which is why I feel like your, your first question about, do you have to instrument and understand everything? No, I think about it kind of like a headlamp. You need to be able to instrument, you know, Computers are having these blips and, and you know, spikes all the time and errors. And until someone comes along and goes, that's meaningful, I need to understand that, you have the luxury of ignoring it. Which is the other reason that I think that like a lot of the LLM stuff is kind of getting it upside down because you know, only people can attach meaning to things and computers can tell you when there are spikes, but like they can't tell you if it means anything. Uh, I will say like the most like unpopular answer and the real answer is like use less technology, right? Like it's maybe not the best thing to say in a cloud native like conference, right? But you know, like, like, like in the end of the day, there. like uh, I'm really trying to help like people, right? Developers troubleshoot faster and so on. But if I could, I build I would build all of my product on Excel or something like that, something that never breaks. <laughs> Super simple. Now there's Python. I like Python. And like, if it would be a possibility, like I really try to keep things as simple as possible. Like, Mainframe. again, <laughs> like, uh, you know, like it did work for like a, a lot of time, but I, I think like people are like, really don't underestimate like how simplicity and less moving parts and less technology really helps down your business, like doing yeah. less. If you can build your app in a lamp stack, by God, do it. So now I'm gonna ask the controversial question. <laughs> then why Kubernetes? <laughs> Uh, I think the answer is because like, like life is complex, right? Like again, I would really wouldn't want like anything, I, no microservices. And this is how Commodore started, like one monolith, one micro, like no microservice, right? Like it was a monolith and one repo and one database and that's it. But you know, it's life. It's to be, to be honest, like it's life. Then you want disability and disability and those two don't act well together. So I think it's always like, on one hand, like, you know, I always love the new shiny thing. There's something inside of me that like, like testing new technologies. 
But finding this balance is, I think, the, the most critical thing. And I think a lot of the people also right in the room, in the conference, we like those, like being on the, the bleeding edge. There's something super fun around that. But then you are on the bleeding edge and like suffering. So I think like finding this balance is super hard. And a lot of the times, like one of the questions that we ask all of our customers is, why did you migrate it to Kubernetes? Like, you know, like you had a setup, it worked, like your company is making a lot of money. Why Kubernetes? And some of them have really good like, reasons. And some of them are like, yeah, everyone is moving to Kubernetes and we're also moving to Kubernetes. Someone in the management said that and like now we're stuck on a seven year migration plan. <laughs> so I think like that's the reality, right? Like again, maybe unpopular, but uh, I think that's reality. Well, I think there's two interesting points though between what you said and what Charity said, right? Charity mentioned that there's layers of the abstractions and things just keep working. And there is simplicity, so it's, it's not to say that Kubernetes itself is simple, right? We've all worked with it. It can get very, very complex. But with these abstractions, you're essentially, you want to simplify the, the, the concerns that you have. And so a lot of what we're doing, yes, Kubernetes is not simple at this point, but it makes life simple for your developers in some ways, right? Because they can just take their app, put in a container, and deploy it, and it generally works, right? And so a lot of what we're doing with technology these days is just shifting where that simplicity is. And so again, you know, keep things as simple as you can for what you need. And for what you need, you're all here. It's probably Kubernetes to make developer lives simple. Unfortunately, it probably makes your life a little more complex. Yeah, you know what else wasn't simple? Having to orchestrate all the different HA proxy and Nginx yeah. and chef roles and everything to do all the shit that Kubernetes now does for us. Like you're sort of localizing complexity in one little place. Yeah, I'm, a, sprawling I'm not sure if like Kubernetes is like dev first. In, yeah, like, I really like Kubernetes, right? Like obviously Kubernetes I started a Kubernetes company, Linux. right? But I, I, I'm not sure if like developers is the first thing because for me, like personally, I hate chef, I hate puppet, I hate like all of those. Sorry, to, when, when I needed to work with them. And then I found out about Kubernetes like seven years ago. And everything is YAML. I don't really like YAML, but it's much better, again, than the alternative. So for me, it's like more, oh, this is a much easier way of saying what do I need as an infra guy. Not necessarily as a developer. Like I worked with containers, like bare born containers, and I had operation guys like doing the chef for me. And it was like good for most, yeah, but most really, time. We shouldn't be making these decisions for technical reasons for the most part. They should be business differentiators. You know, they should be driven by where are we going to spend our innovation tokens? And you know, the only the only like other reason is is if you're trying to hire people and they all want to work on Kubernetes where mm -hmm. they all have that skill set, that's also a super valid reason to do it. But we shouldn't really be like sitting around here talking about which is more complicated is probably the wrong lens to be making technical decisions. Okay. Valid enough. Uh, I'm gonna take a pause and see if anybody from the audience wants to ask anything. Any questions? Go for it. Stand up and uh, ask your question at the mic. Thank you. Did we get way off topic? No. <laughs> we like it when you go off on a tangent. It's fun. I wanted to uh, spin on the Kubernetes thing for a minute and talk specifically about observability in Kubernetes and your reactions to what kinds of things are easier in that context and what kind of things are harder. Great question. Did everybody hear it? Fantastic. Uh, I will say that like in general, Kubernetes makes a lot of things much simpler, like adding like FluentD or like uh, agent and things, things like that. Kubernetes makes standardization much easier. So you can add all of those things even without working like, again, like FluentD, Elastic, Grafana and, and, and so on. So on one thing, it makes adding those observability layers much simpler. And by itself, it, you would have expected things are actually easier. I think the, the main downside of Kubernetes, and again, I love Kubernetes, is it makes things so simple that it's very easy to add more and more like stuff. It's very easy and cheap to add another service. So I think that like most problem with like Kubernetes observability is it allow an easy standardization for everything, which is great, but it allows everyone to start his own container or cluster or namespace. And in reality, because you already have Kubernetes, you are like, yeah, sure, I'll add another service and another service. And before you know it, you have like 500 like services running out in the wild. So I think from an infra perspective, it's much easier. Uh, but from like, you need someone strong saying we shouldn't, like not everything need to be a service, right? So, so that's my answer here. 
Yeah, I'd completely agree. It's, it's trade-offs, right? Some things have become easier, and those, because of scale, have led to other problems. I think the number one thing that um, I think make, makes the most sense to focus on is uh, making sure that we're increasingly collecting our telemetry through the lens of the application, not from, through the lens of the system. Because system-level metrics, you know, they're powerful. If, if your job is running infrastructure, and it, if it is running those low-level systems, um, but for most of us, our job is, is, is not that. It is making our end users happy. And so you need to be able to capture all of your telemetry in ways that will let you slice and dice and say, what was this user's experience like? What was this group of users' experience like? What, you know, it, because it's completely possible for the infrastructure to be healthy, quote unquote, and your users to be very unhappy, or for the infrastructure to be unhealthy and your users to be happy. And which one do you care about most? Well, you always care about the users the most. Yep, that makes sense. Um, anybody else have any questions? Any other, uh, any other questions from the audience? You've got a good point on the, the Kubernetes being standardized and it's a lot simpler. But oftentimes the reality is like we operate pretty much everything on public cloud. That, do, that have a lot of managed moving parts that do not expose subsidiary data. So I see it like in the long run, we kind of get more, less, less, and less visibility compared to what we had when we were running on our own. So what are your thoughts? Because that I feel that I'm feeling the pain already, but I feel it's going to be accelerating a lot in the coming days. I think like it's it's a great point because and, and I think everyone here talked about like the abstraction part, right? Like on one hand, you don't really want to care about the fact that there is like some Linux somewhere in EKS, right? Like you don't want to care about this until you really want to know about this because you are using too much like, uh, I don't know, a bandwidth or, or whatever, iNodes or I, I'm not sure what. Um, so as I see it, like most companies don't really care about, again, from what we see from our customers, they don't really care about the, the underlying infrastructure. For big companies, it's a huge pain. It's a huge problem. I think it's more like of a learning curve for the cloud providers. Like I do hope that like in five years, no one will really need to know because EKS and GK and AKS, like all of them will be good enough. I think we are currently living in a state that the abstraction is not complete and this in turn just like surface the pain on one hand, no easy way to understand it on the other side, which is like bad. But uh, it's mainly for from what we see like for very big enterprises, for like 95% of the users, they don't really need to care. Okay. Um, you're good? Okay. Um, so, I know we touched on this a little bit, but I guess uh, let's expand on it a little bit. Uh, what problems are still unsolved and what is the industry doing to solve them? That's a very broad question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think, World, I think one of the biggest sources of pain continues to be um, just having so many different sources of truth. When you've got like one thing over here for your metrics and dashboards, and you store that same data again for your logs, you store it again for your traces, and you store it again for your profiling, you store it again for your security tool. And like the only thing that knits these things together is you, the person in the middle, who's like just like trying to eyeball timestamps and go, well, this is probably the same thing as that. It's a huge problem. You should have a single source of truth. Uh, from which you can derive the metrics, from which you can derive the... But obviously, I'm a vendor, so I have a vested interest in this. But I think it's a huge problem. Yeah, I think I will also, like, give my side, which is basically... And I think you said it, like, perfectly. There are, like, two kinds of problems on a high level on Kubernetes. There is the end user's problem, which are the developers or that are doing the things that are really moving the business forward, right? And there are the infra people, infra guys people problems. Uh, that is like, uh, I have problem with the nodes, with the memory, and, and so on and so on. And I think like currently there is like a, like a, a very, very like two different camps, like the developers and the ops people, and something somehow need to bridge that. It can be that the developers will be more like opsy, the opsy will be like more developers, or some tools will like be the bridge, but I think where the industry is currently like heading towards, is two very, very different like type of users that are using Kubernetes and each one is cursing the other user because he's not happy with that and somehow they need to coexist and I think like this is what we see the most, like we try to bridge that gap but in reality like 
you know, like I've been, I've talked with people here for like the last five hours or something like that. Developers are complaining on the platform team, not like understanding them and the other way around. And I think like this is something that really holds back our industry, like those camps. Yeah, I'd say that, you know, Charity's point is great because I do find a lot of customers that are like, it's, it is that correlation. Thankfully, like at Datadog, sorry, you set me up. Not to be a bitch, but we have all of those in one place. And what I've found is our problem is actually, when I talk with customers, it has become the thing of, you know, we talked about DevOps and moving developers and operations closer together. And yet, how many of you work at a place where you have like the observability team, right? And it's like, your developers don't care. Your ops people have stopped caring because now it's that observability team's problem. And so we, we keep having these silos in these divisions and See, really I, that's I been the issue. That's not a problem. And I would note that they're in the same place, but there are different data sources. You can't actually correlate them. <laughs> but not to be a bitch. <laughs> but the observability team thing, I think, is actually a really great pattern. In, in, in as far as they're like the... They're doing vendor engineering in a way, you know, because I think that there, there are lots of powerful vendors out there who have these very powerful, powerful tools, but you need a team to kind of be that, that, that layer, be, to, to be making, for example, some libraries that everyone can use uh, that, are, that, are, that are very, you know, idiomatic, that, you know, fit in with your tooling uh, in all the languages that you need and all that stuff. And, and I feel like... Um, I feel like the observability teams that are doing that are really doing God's work. Yeah, I, I mean, there's definitely a, like, a mix, right? There, I'm not saying that observability teams are bad by any means, but there is a natural tendency, especially in some large organizations, where they become those people, right? Yeah. And there's this disconnect, and then people stop to care because that's not my OKRs or my KPIs for the, the monitoring, mm -hmm. and somebody else is watching that. So I can just ignore it, and obviously, yeah. like that's when it becomes you pretty bad. You can't be an engineer if you don't understand how your code is working in production. You can't call yourself an engineer. I, I don't think. I feel like we should coin a new discipline, like DevOps <laughs> or something <laughs> like that. I feel like that's something that uh, we should start that, discussing. I, I actually think that DevOps is on its way out, and here's why. I think that <laughs> <laughs> things we didn't Jenkins ask charity. Please do. Wow. <laughs> go for it. In the beginning. There were engineers who wrote their code and owned it in production. And then systems started to get super complicated. And we we're like, ah, shit, there's too much for one person to do. I know, let's slice it up so that half of us write the code and half of us understand the code. That was a terrible <laughs> idea. DevOps is like trying to knit these things back together and it's a value, it's a very, you know, valid, you know, thing to be doing. But I really feel like that we're, we're all moving back to a world where everyone writes code and everyone is responsible for owning their code in production. Some, some of this is more infrastructure code, some of this is more you know, application code, whatever, but like our systems are actually getting so complex that if you didn't write the code, you're not gonna be able to debug it and operate it. And if you're writing the code, but you're not operating it, you, like, this is all about feedback loops, right? Software engineering is all about having a feedback loop. But if you're not subjecting yourself to the output of the code, the shitty code that you put out there into the world, <laughs> then you're not, you're not actually ever going to understand it in, order, in the way that you need to in order to write good code. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to, we have two minutes left. If there's any more questions from the audience. I have a question. Yes. Um, can you talk to me about like costs and using observability tools to measure costs and like define value for not just observability teams but tools as well? Great. We always love cost questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually have some great blog posts in the Honeycomb uh, blog about we use our own <laughs> observability tooling to do costs and cloud costs and everything. Um, I'm so glad you asked that. I feel like I, I for one, am glad for the death of the zero interest interest rate phenomenon. Um, I think that it's forcing us as engineers to pay attention to costs and, and real business problems. I think that like there's been this pathology since the beginning, of, for, since for a very long time, where CTOs, VPs of engineering are considered like the junior participants in, in the C-level suites because, because we have historically not known how to represent our work in terms of the, the, you know, the universal denominator of, of dollars and cents. Um, so. I don't know. I've got to let Jason take some time to talk to this too. But like, you're on the you're on the right path. We absolutely need to be asking those questions. Yeah, I would say you know when I think of costs, think of it as any other resource, right? And I, I say this because 
with things getting more expensive, so many organizations are like, spend less, spend less, right? But if you were to deploy an app and someone from the C-level came to you and like, less CPU, use less CPU, like, like, what do you do with that? Like, you can't just continue to dial that down and the same with cost. So my, my notion with cost is track it like any other resource and focus on like the effectiveness and, and less on the driving down costs. It's about the value that you create at the end yeah. of the day. Uh, I think like the, the really hard thing about cost is you need to find some balance between like the cost and the reliability or like the, how the code is actually running. I do think like the industry is currently like lacking something in that area. Like there are a lot of cost tools, there's a lot of observability tools, but finding this balance is really, really hard. Like I think it's, it's like one of the biggest like problems I think currently in the industry. We try to solve part of it, but I think that like something do need to change in that regards, like not sure what. Okay. <laughs> Um, so I think uh, we're just about out of time. Uh, thank you all for this uh, really excellent panel. I think uh, we got to touch on a lot of things. I didn't actually get to ask the last question, which I think was the uh, probably the one that everyone wanted to hear was about like kind of open source versus commercial tooling a little bit on, in the space. But everyone we're done. We're out of time, so we'll have hotel. to do it next time. <laughs> Better luck next hotel. time. <laughs> um, but all three of them are here uh, on the ground. You can. Uh, you know, talk to them. Uh, Honeycomb has a booth. Commodore has a booth. Do you guys have a booth? Data yeah, has a booth. Everybody has a booth. Everybody gets a booth. <laughs> um, so you can uh, continue the conversations with them there. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you, Sean. Thank you.